you're off the moji at uh, Wilmer Johns Hopkins and now he's a vice chair at University of Colorado at Denver and he has been attending on to the next little program as planned so uh, let me show you an example of this 34 year old male who is coming to you for a routine ophthalmic evaluation and his visual acuity is normal 6 by 6 and 6 in both the eyes and this is how uh, his uh, optic nerves are looking. So if you see carefully, uh, would anybody venture and say that which, nerves are, which nerve is looking a little off here? One on your left or one on your right? One on your left, yeah. That, that looks maybe that it's a pale looking disc. But issue here is the patient has come without any signs and symptoms. Right? There is no... Uh, visual obscuration, there is no other history. So question is, what is the next step? Would you just go ahead and investigate this as a significant pallor of the optic disc or would you wait and watch? So one thing that we all can do, and if that is available, is to look at the past medical record. If you know that this nerve looked a little different from what it is looking now in, in the previous record, then you know that the present pallor is really significant and it merits all investigation. But if you had a record and it stated 10 years ago the nerve looked the same, then maybe you can just get away with observing it. So the first thing to do if, if you are in this scenario where vision is fine, no symptoms, but the nerve which looks a little off is to see if there is a, a previous record and compare it with the present record. So if the question to answer if am I really pale is to look at past medical records, lens status. Remember, aphakia or pseudophakia can alter the appearance of the nerve. It can also be altered by your examination technique and the brightness of uh, your examination tool, which can be indirect ophthalmoscope or slit lamp, or other anomalies which can make pale disc. If you're still in doubt, uh, if you don't have past medical record, what I would do is go ahead and perform the optic nerve function test and make sure that optic nerve is functioning well. So nerve which is leaking off, but the optic nerve is completely fine, the functions are fine, you can still observe. And these are the, this is the list of uh, optic nerve function test. Now the same holds true for disc edema as well. So the first question when you are not very sure about a nerve, whether it's really swollen or whether it's really pale, is to say whether is it a pseudo pallor or a pseudo disc edema or is it a real thing? So here again, this does look like congenitally anomalous disc. And if you want to confirm whether this is significant or not significant, again, look at the past medical record. If you know that the disc was not really swollen and has got swollen now, uh, need to investigate. If you don't have a past medical record, again, go back and perform the optic nerve function test. In both scenarios, um, believe me, there are instances where you will still not be able to differentiate between a true and a pseudo disc edema or a pseudo pallor. OCT might be a good tool to tell you whether is there any RNFL loss in the presence of pale disc or RNFL swelling which is changing over a period of time in the presence of a disc edema. So scenario number one, pale or swollen disc, first thing to do is to make sure that it's a true swelling and this is the way by, by which you can establish that it's a true swelling. Now let's look at scenario number two. This is a 46-year-old female who, uh, who came to you with a loss of vision in the left eye for the last six months, and the visual equity in the left eye is 6 by 12. The right eye is fine. And this is how our optic nerves look like. And you see here, the affected eye does have a swelling with uh, a hemorrhage on the surface of the optic nerve. So now question is, what do you do next? The next would be to slot it. This is a 46-year-old female with an acute painless loss of vision. So next step now would be to slot it into one of these categories. This is an optic neuropathy. You perform optic nerve function test. You found that optic nerve is not functioning well. So it could be one of these. Question is, can it be hereditary optic neuropathy in a 46-year-old female with an acute loss of vision? Answer is no. Only hereditary optic neuropathy which can present with acute or subacute loss of vision would be LHON. But LHON, because it, is, uh, it, it has mitochondrial inheritance, the clinically full-blown picture would be seen only in males. Females can have a subclinical signs of uh, harboring a disease, but they would never have a full-blown 
loss of vision, at least for all practical purposes. All other hereditary optic neuropathy would be bilateral, would have a gradual onset of vision, a gradual onset of loss of vision, and would be progressive. Can it be nutritional or a toxic optic neuropathy? Again, the same argument. Generally, it will be bilateral and gradually progressive. Only uh, toxic optic neuropathy, which will come with an acute loss of vision, would be methanol toxicity, where the history will rule that out. Compressive optic neuropathy, well, it is very rare for a compressive lesion to present in an acute fashion unless there was a sudden expansion of a tumor because of bleeding within the tumor. So in a 46-year-old female with an optic neuropathy, you are looking at a differentiation between inflammation and ischemia. Which one do you think would, uh, would be first in your diagnosis? Would it be inflammation or ischemia in a 46-year-old female? Right. Uh, because of the age, you will say that this is more likely to be AION anterior ischemic optic neuropathy rather than inflammation. Inflammation or optic neuritis is a disease of a little younger age group, 20 or 30 years. In the age group 40 or 50, you will say that this is AION. Now you say that the disc is uh, um, swollen, but the vision is not really poorly affected. AION is of two types, arthritic or non-arthritic. This is more likely to be non-arthritic anti-ischemic optic neuropathy. What do you do if you, if you encounter a patient with NIM? And we'll hear about that from Dr. Prem a little later um, uh, in the course. But first important issue is to make sure that there are no vasculopathic risk factors and that uh, it's, it's fair to refer the patient to a primary care physician. The evidence suggests that this is what we can offer to our patient. Sleep apnea seems to be associated with ischemia everywhere in the body and same with NIAVN. So uh, order the patient, uh, give them a sleep study and if patient has sleep apnea, treat that, at least that may help. In a male patient, it's fair to uh, discontinue erectile dysfunction drugs like Viagra. Uh, Amiodarone should be substituted because it does produce a, a clinical picture which is similar to AION and smoking should be discontinued. Uh, a small number of patients with AION can have a progressive loss of vision. Uh, otherwise, NIOIN generally the vision goes down and it stays there. And it, over a period of time, it may improve. In, in about one third of these patients, vision can improve. But a small measure, a small, patient, a small number of patients can have a progressive loss of vision. These are the people who are more likely to have a renal disorder. And so a nephrologist consultation would be in order. A similar scenario, a 70-year-old female with a sudden painful loss of vision, a profound loss of vision now. And here, how the nerves look like. Here you see there is an infarction in an acute phase of uh, ischemia, and the other nerve has a fairly good cup. Now, this is a feature of arthritic AON. In a non-arthritic anti-ischemic optic neuropathy, you, will, you are likely to find a small disc with a small cup, what is described as disc at risk or a uh, disc at risk. While here you see there is a large cup, an acute infarction, profound loss of vision, it is pointing more towards an arthritic AION. What do you do? It's an emergency. Uh, you need to order ESR. Generally, it will be high. Why it is an emergency? Because the ischemia has occurred because of a systemic problem. It, it can go to the other optic nerve within the matter of few hours. And that's the reason why these patients would need immediate steroids. So scenario number two was a pale or a swollen disc in the setting of ischemia. You, uh, you need to differentiate between non-arthritic and arthritic variety of AION and look at first progressive or recurrent attacks. <laughs> look at the third case, a 25-year-old male who comes to you with now a gradual loss of vision in the left eye. Vision was 660 in the left eye and 69 in the right eye. And you see here, this disc has a pallor mainly in the nasal and temporal part the superior and inferior part, the superior and inferior poles look fairly all right. So this is a sort of an example of a bow tie optic atrophy or a band shaped optic atrophy. Now when you encounter a patient with a bow tie or a band shaped optic atrophy, uh, it is more likely to be because of a loss of a nasal fibers, that is fibers nasal to macula, and which generally occurs in a chiasmal compression or a contralateral optic tract compression. This was a patient who had a junctional scotoma and had uh, a lesion at the optic chiasm. So pale disc in the, in the setting of a progressive loss of vision definitely merits uh, uh, neuroimaging because a progressive loss of vision with a pale disc, uh, that means the disease process is going on and the other eye fields might also give you a clue as to where is the level of lesion. Case number four is a 28-year-old female who comes to you with a both eyes gradual loss of vision for the last six weeks. Vision, vision loss is moderate, and this is how the nerves look like. So a 28-year-old female with a bilateral disc edema with a progressive loss of vision, you need to rule out 
raised intracranial pressure. Now, so first thing first, this you would term as papillary edema under investigation because you are suspecting raised intracranial pressure. And you would advise a battery of tests to make sure that there is no structural lesion which is causing this raised ICP. So papilledema, which has not been investiga investigated before, is also an emergency. Because if papilledema or raised ICP is because of a structural lesion, a tumor in the brain, it can lead to brainstem herniation and uh, it can be fatal. So it has to be investigated immediately. Once you have ruled out a structural lesion, ophthalmologist role comes in because it is likely to be IIH, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Treatment can be instituted by a neurologist, but you would monitor the treatment um, if, it's, if you decide to do medical treatment. Now, if you're in a center where you have an access to uh, a surgeon who performs optic nerve sheet fenestration, like in Bangalore, Dr. Jyoti does high number of optic nerve sheet fenestration, then uh, you might have to discuss with her whether optic nerve sheet fenestration is warranted or not. These are the other signs and symptoms that you'll ask for in a patient who has raised ICP. Headache, pulsatile tinnitus and transient visual obscuration are two symptoms which are associated with uh, raised intracranial pressure. The transient visual obscuration in a raised ICP is generally lasting for a few seconds versus a transient visual obscuration of vascular insufficiency which lasts for a few minutes. In, in papilledema, these TVOs are described as browning out of vision and generally are related to the change of posture. So treatment options are given here. Bilateral optic disc edema but not papilledema. One condition which is often missed out is hypertensive retinopathy. The clue would be uh, features in the peripheral part of the retina. You will find cotton wool spots or hemorrhages in the peripheral part of the retina. Pseudopapilledema, these are the features, uh, generally small disc with a small cup. You will be able to see the medium and a large size vessel on the surface of the optic disc. Generally, the disc functions will be normal except for field effects in few cases of drusen or myelinated nerve fiber. So this is a 34-year-old male which we saw, uh, I and Dr. Amika saw when uh, uh, we were in, in Shankar It's a real case where vision was 3 by 60 in both the eyes. Patient already had got MRI uh, elsewhere because patient had, feel, uh, patient had pale disc. Uh, would anybody would have done anything else before ordering MRI brain in orbit here? Before that, before that, I'm sure that a person really missed out. Even before that, just a dilated fundus examination would have said that, yeah, well, this is not a neuroophthalmic problem. This is a retinal problem. And a patient definitely at this point in time does not uh, merit any MRI or uh, brain on orbit. What he needs is, uh, is a proper examination of retina and then go through uh, the other ERG or whatnot. So the other, apart from RP, uh, the other conditions which can present the pale disc, the ocular conditions would be syphilis, sarcoidosis, the vasculitis because of this, Bechet's disease or tuberculosis. So pale disc with reduced vision, optic nerve function test and dilated fundus examination is what you would perform. This is a 10-year-old female who came to us with a reduced vision in, for the last four months. She was seen by an ophthalmologist to begin with and she was given a diagnosis of uh, a pseudo disc edema and was asked to observe. She went to neurologist for other complaints and then neurologist thought that because there is a bilateral disc edema and uh, there are some other symptoms, this would be probably uh, increased intracranial pressure. Patient was put on Dimox and patient continued to take acetazolamide for four months. But while she was on acetazolamide, her disc continued to look like this and she had loss of vision. So that's where neurologist panicked and sent the patient back to, uh, to ophthalmologist and that's how uh, we saw the patient. And what patient actually had was this multiple vitreous cells. Patient had bilateral uh, pars planitis which had caused vitreitis and CME, and CME, because it was never treated, was the cause of loss of vision. So please remember, disc edema can also come because of uveitic entities, hypotony, as was described a few days ago, even post-cataract surgery, if there was, even gas syndrome can produce disc edema. So always look at the eye carefully to make sure that disc edema is not really coming from the surrounding structure or from the ocular abnormality, and uh, it is not really, it, it's not always neurological. This is again a case which we saw in, uh, in SN. It was a 46-year-old male with a sudden painful loss of vision in the left eye. And the vision was no PL. It went from 6-9 to no PL in three days. 
and this is how her, his optic disc looked like a very angry looking optic disc with a rot spot so this is an example where an infiltrative optic neuropathy can also present to you with a disc edema where the disc edema looks very it's it looks very impressive massive disc edema with hemorrhages it could be in um, uh, infiltrative optic neuropathy Infl infiltration of the optic nerve can come because of systemic disorders like like leukemia cancers in the body or in this case it turned out to be infection so in other words if you see a patient with a disc edema or a pale disc perform optic nerve function test look at color vision visual fields carefully look at the blood vessels and the retina carefully to to give you a clue whether this is a pseudo disc edema or whether this is a pale disc because of a retinal problem always think of a uveitic entity or other features in the eye which can produce both elevated disc or a pale disc and always look for systemic association so in short if if i just show you this in rajasthan in jaipur you will say oh, okay three rajasthanis or three indians are having good time what it turned out to be was these three great neuroophthalmologists some of them are teachers dr neil miller dr peter savino dr andy lee who had visited the last aioc in jaipur and we are thankful prem that you are here with us thank you so much test to make sure that it is not neurological so as uh, dr dipankar mentioned that uveitic entity can also be associated with neurological association like apmpp can have uh, mri abnormalities in the eye which used to be used as a marker for disease activity of multiple sclerosis uh, which can have uh, uh, lines fine lines or pigmented lines along, along uh, the the blood vessels they were called rucker's lines and they were one of the markers of uh, the disease activity of multiple sclerosis but absolutely agree dr pankar that uh, some of these neurological disorder can have uveitis as part of its spectrum so dr satyakarna is ready for his talk on anisocoria good afternoon uh, so we'll be dealing with how to approach anisocoria so as we know basically there are these anatomical considerations and uh, we know that the parasympathetic system supplies the sphincter of the iris and the sympathetic system supplies the dilator of the iris so we go to the pathway and uh, we are aware of the most important structures in this pathway that is the pretectal nuclei the edinger westphal nuclei and the ciliary ganglion of the third nerve so any uh, visual light stimulus falling on the eye uh goes to this brain stem and from there it goes to both the pupils and causes equal pupillary constriction on both sides if the constriction is not equal uh the uh, reaction when we test it with a direct light uh on thrown on each eye and swinging flashlight test we will get a rapd or an anisocoria now what we are looking for here is anisocoria that is difference in the size of the pupils the sympathetic pathway uh as we have discussed deals with the dilator pupils and the pathway the important structures on this pathway are the hypothalamus the um, superior cervical ganglion and then it goes to the dilator pupillae now we come to the disorders per se that is the important part of this topic the there is a component of physiological anisocoria in 10% of normal subjects so uh, please remember this don't miss this part there is no dilatation lag in this and uh, the important thing is not to miss pathological anisocoria so how do we look for that we look we test the patient in the light conditions and in the dark conditions so let's go to uh, case 1 a 50 year old male with a difference in the size of the pupils which he noticed himself in the mirror this is a question you should ask patients because uh, many times they have not noticed it and many times when you ask them they go back and look in the mirror and then they tell you and uh, sometimes uh, the uh, that makes him more aware of other symptoms uh, and uh, you know the position of the eyelid which is also important so you can see there's a difference in the position of the eyelid here okay so you see that the left eyelid is drooping a bit so when we talk about uh, this kind of a patient who has a nisocoria we have to go into detailed history we ask for history of trauma we ask him if he has any old close up 
uh, face photographs which usually people carry on mobiles these days. So it's not difficult to get even three, four, five years old photographs, uh, especially so people take lots of, uh, uh, you know, youngsters take a lot of photographs, so it's easy to find out. And uh, then you look for ptosis. That is a very important sign that you're looking for. A patient may not have noticed it, but there may be a difference of one or two mm, which is very important. Then also, uh, you may not be able to appreciate the pupils uh, because the photographs are not really taken for that. But then uh, we know there is the red reflex in many photographs and then it might just help. And when the patient is looking in different directions, you might notice a difference in the size of the pupil by the reflex that comes in. So also you ask for a history of topical medications. The patient may be using a lot of, uh, you know, uh, eye drops. Uh, he may be on anti-glaucoma drugs or many other things. And also systemic medications because some of the uh, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic system is affected by some of the medications. Now we look for exposure to toxins and drugs and we ask for other associated symptoms uh, which may be uh, related to the neurological system like uh, facial weakness or, or you know drooping of the lid or uh, uh, dripping of uh, saliva or a hearing deficit or a weakness of limbs. So we come now to which pupil is abnormal. So we are interested in, as I said, we look at the pupils in the light and then in the dark. And if the anisocoria is more in the dark, that means that the small pupil is abnormal. And we are looking then for a dilatation lag and a ptosis. So in this patient, he had a smaller pupil on the side which had the ptosis. So uh, traditionally, it is said that we should test with 10% cocaine and the small pupil will not dilate and that would mean it's a Horner syndrome. But if both pupils dilate symmetrically, then it is a physiological anisocoria. If the anisocoria is equal in light and dark, and both the, reacts, both the pupils react briskly to light, then we are simply looking at physiological anisocoria. So very important thing that the pupils, the difference in the size is equal in light and dark, and they are briskly reacting to light. Then you just consider it a physiological anisocoria. But on the other hand, when you look at an isocoria which is more in the light, that means that the large pupil is abnormal. And that means we are looking at the parasympathetic system. So there you have to, again, look at ocular movements. If there is limitation of ocular movements, you are looking at a third nerve palsy. Even if it is partial, then you look for uh, the reaction to medication. That is, there are two tests. One is with pilocarpine, 0.125%. And you can get a constriction in case of AD's tonic pupil. You may not get a constriction in that eye. And then you look for uh, further uh, a pharmacological anisocoria. So in the history, you have to ask for any topical medication. Even if the patient had just visited another ophthalmologist and there he had a dilatation done. So you have to be very careful in these uh, points in history. So this patient, uh, coming to the signs that he had and the other signs that you expect in this, the Horner syndrome, you can have meiosis along with the mild, usually mild ptosis and uh, an upside down ptosis of the lower eyelid, which is a little difficult to detect. You can have an apparent enophthalmos and hydrosis on the same side, a heterochromia if it is a congenital Horner's and a transient finding may be a low IOP or increased accommodation. So you look at the picture again, now you can identify at least two of these signs here, uh, mild ptosis and a small pupil on the left side. So this patient <coughs> uh, would undergo a dark test and there, uh, instead of cocaine and the other step being hydroxyamphetamine, instead of that, I'll just tell you what we do. Uh, if the patient, if the pupil does not, uh, you know, if, the, if cocaine is instilled and the pupil responds, then we are looking at Horner syndrome on the right side. We use 1% hydroxyamphetamine and we therefore localize the lesion, whether it is preganglionic or postganglionic. So what we do is that cocaine blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine and uh, instead we have apraclonidine drops, alpha drops, uh, which can be used in the diagnosis. So this is to confirm the diagnosis and then we can use Phenylephrine 1%, uh, which is available uh, from Orolab or Sunways, we can use this to differentiate pre from post ganglionic. In this, uh, these, these are a very good substitute to hydroxyamphetamine. 
these are the various uh, sites of lesion the first order neuron can be affected by a cerebral vascular accident trauma tumor or a demyelinating lesion and even syringomyelia whereas the second order neuron can be affected you have to look for the apex of the lung and so you're looking at a chest lesion a ca lung or a mediastinous mass or even a trauma to the neck uh, thyroid neoplasm and surgery a third order neuron if there is a lesion in uh, there is a complicated otitis media or there is a cavernous sinus lesion uh, also in case of internal carotid artery dissection or a nasopharyngeal carcinoma so though these are rare but be careful when you see an anisocoria which is more in the dark and look for ptosis and look for horner syndrome so this patient this as an example of a traumatic left internal carotid artery as shown by the uh, artery dissection as shown by the arrow the case 2 uh, carefully look at the video clinically patient has anisocoria the right pupil is large and when we do the swinging flashlight test uh, we've been repeating it constantly from right to left and left to right and we keep doing it repeatedly and as you see there is no reaction at all in either pupil now this patient has not used any topical drops his history has been confirmed again and what he has basically here now it's a dilated pupil on the right side and uh, there is uh, there is no change in the anisocoria uh, in light or dark that is important but what we find here is the pupils are tonic and in such cases uh, we can use diluted pilocarpine and if the pupil responds to that and somewhat becomes similar to size to the other pupil then we are looking at ad's pupil so ad's pupil is idiopathic 80% of these cases are unilateral but they go on to become unilateral and over a period of 2 years or 3 years they start recovering again some amount of uh, constriction comes in the, there is a tonic response to near effort also and the etiology is usually in the ciliary ganglion the, it is said it is viral in origin and uh, there is a cholinergic super sensitivity 2.125% pilocarpine so that confirmed this patient uh, had a tonic constriction to uh near response this is the third patient again uh, not to miss this condition clinically patient looks uh, orthophoric but he has a mild ptosis in the right eye and when you see the pupillary reaction the left pupil is smaller and the right pupil there is a an isocoria as you can notice here the right pupil is slightly larger and fixed it is not responding to direct light and uh, this patient had now look carefully abduction in the right eye is full adduction is limited and when he looks up you see elevation is limited and when he looks down the depression is limited so this patient though not very outstanding but when you see these limitations with a dilated pupil you are considering a third nerve palsy and this patient also had aberrant regeneration with a pseudo one graphe sign Uh, he gave a history of a congenital uh, squint and uh, this case had a normal mri of the brain next slide next okay so the uh, yeah. last case the time is up this is the last case should okay. i wind up yeah please no no please go ahead well, go fast okay this is these are no okay, keep it on no this case for that's all Yeah, yeah, fine, fine, fine. Okay, so this patient has a gross anisocoria with a fixed dilated pupil in the right eye. Limitation of adduction. Abduction is normal. Depression is limited. Elevation is limited. So this patient had an aneurysm, which was confirmed on MRI and uh, DCA. And this patient underwent coiling of the internal carotid artery PCOM aneurysm. And you see marked improvement after that. Though there is limitation of movements, but she improved. Now this was an emergency and. So so a dilated pupil in a third nerve palsy needs immediate imaging and treatment thank you good afternoon everyone first of all let me thank professor gandhi for this opportunity and i am going to talk on the unexplained visual loss decoding 
See, it's very common as a general ophthalmologist to pack the cause, pack the case to your neuro-ophthalmology friend that when you don't find any positive evidence in your clinical findings, what is the reason for the vision loss in such a patient? I think as a neuro-ophthalmology, my friends would agree that we'll be happy to see a swollen disc or even a, a pale disc instead of having a normal appearing fundus because an unexplained vision loss always has a tag of a functional visual loss along with it. So you have to differentiate a functional visual loss from an organic condition. So we have to differentiate an optic neuropathy from a retinopathy and it can be even a simple refractive error as a cause for the unexplained vision loss. So atypical presentations would require a detailed and a comprehensive neuroophthal evaluation and a clinical expertise to deal with these cases. We have a lot of electrophysiological studies and neuroimaging is only going to help you as and when it is required because it may not be useful in all the cases. And there are a lot of medical legal pitfalls in this particular entity, and so we have to watch out for these. As I told, we have a l different types of disc edema, what Dr. Gandhi has already explained. We start with a simple pseudo edema to an infiltrative optic neuropathy. We are happy to see these disc edemas, or even a pale disc can give you a different types of causes. It can be a primary optic atrophy to a bauti where we have an unexplained vision loss and you can have an intracranial tumor. So we have to follow a systematic approach. We have to go with a detailed clinical step starting with a best corrected visual acuity, perform all the optic nerve function tests. We may not be missing it. So color vision to pupillary evaluation, slit lamp examination, and a detailed fundus evaluation. And as I told, we have a plethora of electro diagnostic procedures and we have we uh, and uh, OCT both disc as well as the macular protocol has a significance because in many conditions we have I think in one of the cases Dr. Gandhi had showed that we would see an RNFL loss in a condition if it is pale disc we can also see an RNFL loss and a GCL loss even if the optic nerve is normal and particularly in a demyelinating pathology because we don't need an episode of an optic neuritis to trigger an NFL loss in that particular condition so a Humphrey vision visual field analysis, a simple Amsler test, ultrasound and a fluorescent angiogram. This basic examination in your OPD will give you a clue whether you're dealing with an optic nerve function disorder or not. A relative afferent pupillary defect can be picked only in case of a monocular optic neuropathy. And if it's going to be a binocular optic nerve dysfunction, you're going to just see a sluggishly reacting pupil. It's quite blinding, what is that? So, yeah, thanks. So, if you're going to deal with the optic nerve function disorder, always allow your patient to talk because history taking is very vital in neuroophthalmology. So, the presenting symptoms, if he's going to harbor an optic nerve pathology, can be anywhere something starts with, I'm looking everything cloudy, smudgy, or darkness. And sometimes you can even pick up a central scotoma if a patient is going to give a history of central black patch which he is not able to see. So the colors can appear less vibrant and sometimes patient can give also the altitudinal field loss and the tempo of the visual loss and the TVOs which are proceeding to that. So when I talk about the tempo of the vision loss, anything if you see a gradual painless progressive drop in vision, it's going to be a compressive. If it's going to be anything, a sudden drop in vision with a very good improvement and it's going to perceive uh, stable at a platform, it's going to be a inflammatory pathology and optic neuritis. And if it's going to drop severely, does not improve that much and going to remain a low plateau, it's going to be an ischemic optic neuropathy. So the tempo of the vision loss will give you a clue whether what type of optic neuropathy you're dealing with. And if it's going to be a macular association, obviously a patient is going to come with a blurred vision, a transient acquired hyperopia, distortion, and metamorphopsias. So you also have to use, if it's going to be a monocular condition, rule out a history of trauma, or any, if, if it is going to be a binocular pathology, a systemic disease association. And age has a vital uh, indication in case if you're going to come down, it's macular is the cause for the loss of vision. So I'm going to start with a few example cases as the other friends have done. This is a 65-year-old male who was brought to me by the son. He said that my dad is not seeing for the past one week. When I saw him, he had bilateral brisk reacting pupil. He just had a perception of light. And he had a very dense cataract. And you can also see a small exotropia of his left eye. And his fundus evaluation had a lens haze and had a normal fundus. And VEP had a good waveforms with a mild delay in latency. Still, what is the reason for the vision loss? What is the next investigation you would ask now? 
Anyone? What is the cause? Is he malingering, this old man? No. So the next investigation is obviously an MRI brain and orbit. In fact, the son gave a vital clue that he was bumping into objects for the past six months, but for, Pada, for the past one week, he is not able to see, and he is not accepting that he is not able to see. And that's it. So this is the MRI brain and orbit. He had an acute inf infarct of late, and he had a chronic infarct. Thankfully, it has knocked both the occipital lobes, and that's the reason for his vision loss. This is a cortical visual impairment. So do not touch such cataracts to operate because you're not going to get a good visual recovery. So all my general ophthalmology friends think that we are all like this, but only my friends will accept that we do have a lot of difficult situations like this in our day-to-day -day practice. So I'm going to run through a few of those cases. This is a 17-year-old girl who was brought to me with a sudden vision loss. She was brought during her board examination. She had a bilateral drop in vision and a normal anterior and a fundus evaluation. In fact, she was brought by the father saying that she's malingering. That's what my local doctor had told me. So what is the next investigation what I would ask here? This is the fundus and pupils are sluggishly reacting in both the eyes with no relative afferent effect and she almost perceived hand movements in some quadrants and the fundus is normal. What is the test next I'm going to ask for? is delayed latency and with the minimal amplitude reduction in one eye. So I told the father that there is something wrong with the bilateral optic nerve pathways. Better, it is a probable uh, retrobulbar neuritis. So now you go for an MRI brain in orbit, which was normal. So I advised for an IV methylprednisolone therapy as per the ONTT protocol and her visual acuity improved by two weeks to 618. And by one month, she almost recovered to 6.9 and 6. But still her color vision was also having a drop and feels persisted having a central defects as we see over here. So four years later, she came back saying that I have finished my course and I'm going to go outside India. So I came to thank you. And that's how in one of the casual shots, she told me that uh, she's having a difficulty, a sensation, unable to hold the pen. And sometimes I have a poor bladder control. That's a vital history what a female with a history of optic neuritis is going to give you. So the patients, when I, and when she had, she had a temporal pallor, she had persisting central defects. I told you better leave, before leaving India, you get an MRI done, meet the neurologist and go. And her, this was her visual field defects. And this is what you see in her MRI when I asked for. These are classical periventricular signals which are going to depict these are Dawson's fingers. Probably she has a feature of demyelinating spectrum, a MS also. But this lady, she also had some small spinal cord lesions over the cervical spine. And she had negative for OCB, oligoclonal bands, and she was negative for aquaporin antibody. So the neurologist has advised her to go on for an interferon therapy. She, she continued to maintain a 6-6 vision. See this patient reported to us as an unexplained or a probable malingerer, and she end up over here. So we have to be very careful in picking such cases because these can be going in for a debilitating pathology like multiple sclerosis, and they can be wheelchair bound. So we can at least help them going in for an early disease modifying therapy in such conditions. So this is a second female who was brought by the husband now, and this time the husband told she's malingering. So she is a 36 year old with a sudden drop in vision over the past two months she was complaining that she's not able to see but she said that there was a mild improvement but it's still not that good but she's reading 6-6 six, six and N6 she did not she's having a monocular vision loss she's not having a relative afferent defect color vision is normal VEP is normal fundus is this is what you see the fundus probably normal so how many of you would agree that, with the husband that she's malingering <laughs> definitely not that's why I'm presenting here because this is what I saw in the visual field can I have two minutes so this is what I saw in the visual fields. So what do you see here in the left eye? This is something, a big blind spot defects we are seeing over here. And I asked her, she already had an MRI brain which was normal because in fact she was at, referred here to rule out a retrobulbar neuritis to me because she had a inocular vision loss. Her FFA showed a mild disc staining and OCT had a normal NFL thickness. So how many of you would agree that this is an optic neuritis? Fine. This is the diagnosis what I made. So probably she had been having some subtle lesions in the retina by the time when I saw her, those would have resolved. So she could be a probable mutes or an acute idiopathic blind spot. Enlargement is an entity where we do not require any steroid therapy and we just have to watch the patient over a period of time. This is four months down and 10 months down. So this is not a 
optic neuritis or anything. I will just run through a couple of cases. Do I have time, Rashmi? One more. So this is a 74-year-old male with a progressive drop in vision. He had a good vision and all color vision, everything normal. This is the fundus montage, which looks apparently a normal disc. And this is his visual fields, almost like a constricted fields, like an acquired RP. So what is the next investigation of choice? So this is it. So it's a flat ERG, and the diagnosis was... Unless we did a CT chest, we were not able to pick up. He had a CA lung, so it was a cancer-associated retinopathy or probably a paraneoplastic optic neuropathy. So these do present with such conditions. And this is the last case what I'm going to show. Yeah, this is an 18-year-old female who came with a sudden drop in vision in the right eye. And she also had apparently a mild ptosis in the right eye, which she told she's been noticing it after, for off late. Her extraocular movements were full, no diplopia, fundus was normal, and MRA brain. She told doctor, don't give importance to my ptosis. Explain what is the reason for the vision drop. But I was more interested why it is both in the right side. So I thought we are missing something in the investigation. And my intern told that I have done the fundus examination, no cause for the vision drop. So now we have two conditions. I called her only for a pupillary evaluation. After Dr. Satyakarna's wonderful talk, I think we will be able to pick up what you see here. There is a droop in the right eye, and that's a meiotic pupil, what you're seeing over there. So what all she needs is not only an MRA brain, she needed something extra. So this is what it is. She had a neck mass lesion, which was close to the eye carotid artery. This was nothing but a right harness. And then what is the cause for the drop in vision? She was positive for microtropia. So she got to know that she's having a microtropia after the ptosis. So that was a wonderful combination what I saw in my OPD. So this is the cause for the vision loss. So to conclude, optic neuropathy can be picked up by the tempo of the vision loss. And the vision loss usually is disproportionate to the findings. Maculopathy will have a lot of macular function dis, uh, dysfunction symptoms and Amsler testing will be useful to delineate the central defects only. Electrophysiological test does have some role in particularly pinning down the cause. So in neuro-ophthalmology practice, if you're not able to make a diagnosis after completing the patient's examination, what is the golden rule? Go back to history taking. Thank you. While we are setting up the next talk, any questions for Dr. Satya? Yeah, you can go ahead. Actually, we have sent the patient for a anti anti recurrent antibody, and we are awaiting the. <laughs> <laughs> Not available. Not available. <laughs> The Diamox really is a, temp a measure that I give for as long as it takes for the underlying cause to be addressed. So if it's a venous sinus thrombus. For idiopathic, really, the, the key is still weight loss. And I have found in my practice that if the patient does not lose weight, if the underlying weight loss doesn't occur, then you end up in a cycle where you continue on the Diamox. When you try to taper it off, the papilledema comes back because the underlying problem, the obesity, hasn't been addressed. There is also a role for decreasing sodium in the diet and things like that. But in most cases, I think that even though in IIH in India the degree of obesity is less, I think the data are still there that weight loss is still necessary for the disease to go into remission. Technically, localize it to superior cervical ganglion, previous pre-ganglionic or post-ganglionic. And then you can uh, ask for a particular scan of that location, right? You, then you are looking for a specific lesion in a specific area. That is about it. So you have to go for the scan? Yes, of course. All right. If there are no further questions, then we'll move on. When you see a patient with ptosis, is this ptosis neurological? What are the signs that will guide you as to uh, whether it's neurological or whether it is congenital or involutional? So why it is important to make sure that you are not dealing with a ptosis which is because of a neurological aspect? Because this, this was a patient who had 
this kind of ptosis. And the history was a little vague. So he was advised not to undergo any treatment for it because it was under investigation. Um, he nonetheless was very, uh, very bothered about uh, his cosmetic appearance and he underwent uh, surgery. And this is a post-operative picture where you see the ptosis has become a little worse. There is a lid lag now. And this was because of um, a neurological uh, problem and the ptosis was the first sign of it. So this is the reason why it is important to differentiate between congenital aponeuric ptosis, which would improve with a, with a surgery, immediate surgery, versus a neurological or a myogenic cause of ptosis where a surgery may, may have a disastrous results. So when we say neurological cause of ptosis, I would be dealing with myopathies, uh, third nerve or a sympathetic nerve or a myasthenia. Let me show you a, a video. Uh, how would I play a video? I have some videos here. A 52-year-old male uh, who comes to you with uh, unilateral ptosis for one year. Now what do you think? Look at the right eyelid carefully. Do you think this is congenital? Well, this was acute onset, so it's not congenital. Do you think it's aponeurotic? Possible? Look at the lids carefully and see it is doing this funny movement as the, the lids are moving around. Right? This is Kugan's lid twitch. And here we are demonstrating an enhancement of ptosis. So when you, when you say enhancement of ptosis or a seesaw ptosis, it's based on Hiring's law. So when you elevate the one lid, the other lid generally droops down. Now it can be seen in any kind of ptosis, but in a mild ptosis, this is much more impressive. Uh, the other sign which was shown in that video was Kogan's lid twitch, where when you ask the patient to look down for 10 to 15 seconds and ask him to make an upward saccade, ask him to look at your nose uh, or ask him to look at the primary position, any object. And you'll find that the lid goes up, twitches for a while, and then settles down. Kogan's lid twitch is uh, an important sign which tells you that patient might be having uh, ocular myasthenia gravis. Now this is an eight-year-old female with an unreliable history, a patient which was seen in Chennai. She was given a diagnosis of congenital ptosis elsewhere. Do you think she has a congenital ptosis? Likely, unlikely. Obviously, we have a talk here, so it's unlikely. You can see clearly see the lid crease here, right? So in a patient who has unreliable history but have features which are a little suspicious, you need to perform the further testing before you subject the patient to for a surgery. You see here the other eye has, sorry, and see other eye had, a, uh, other eye had a little uh, lid retraction there. So what would you do next? You have a little suspicion here, patient has a mild ptosis. It does not appear to be congenital ptosis. So before subjecting this patient for surgery, what test would you advise? Any idea? So first thing first, does it change? Does it vary? Most of the uh, ptosis, which is because of myasthenia, would vary, either because of the fatigue, because of the uh, uh, constant activity. Here again, we are, we are trying to test for Kogan's lit twitch. Patient looks down and then looks at the primary gaze. And here, a test for fatigability, where patient keeps looking up for a period of time and see whether ptosis increases. And it does appear that once the patient has looked up for a while, the ptosis has increased. And here is a simple test, ice test, and you see that ptosis has disappeared. So this is again an important test to perform. Ice test, sensitivity is 90%, specificity is 100%, though please remember that it is not reliable in a complete ptosis. So patient who has ocular myasthenia gravis and presents to you with complete ptosis, you would not rely on ice test to diagnose or exclude ocular myasthenia gravis. This is a 70-year-old female with a bilateral ptosis, and this is how she presented. Uh, do you think this is a aponeurotic ptosis? Would you subject the patient to surgery? Well, before... Subjecting patient to surgery, always rule out whether patient has features of uh, ocular myasthenia. You find here that while the ocular motility is being checked, you will see that the right ptosis is increasing already. Also has a Kogan's lid twitch. Patient looks down, looks to a primary gaze, and you see the upper eyelid flickers. 
So obviously, though, the features do look like eponeuroatosis, but what patient actually had was oclomycinia gravis. This is an example. Now, what do you think here? Again, an elderly lady with bilateral drooping of eyelid. So here all, again, uh, test for fatigability, test for uh, Kogan's lit twitch, and an orbicularized oclitone, which is not being shown here, is being performed. One of the important signs which can guide you in these cases is weakness of orbicularized ocule. Please remember, weakness of orbicularized ocule can be one of the early signs of ocular myasthenia gravis. How do you test it? Ask the patient to tightly squeeze the eye and try to gently open it. If the orbicularized ocular tone is weak, you'll be able to easily open the eye, uh, uh, even if the patient is trying to squeeze it tightly. And that can be an early sign of ocular myasthenia gravis. Remember, aponeurotosis can also, uh, a patient can perceive that it is getting worse as the days go by, but the other signs would be absent. Now, what uh, other tests can be performed if you're suspecting a patient with um, ocular myasthenia gravis? Uh, if you order acetyl, uh, let's say you are suspecting a patient with OMG and you have ordered acetyl acetylcholine receptor antibodies and they are negative, does it rule out uh, OMG? Well, it does not rule out OMG because ACI, uh, acetylcholine antibodies antibodies is in a pure ocular variant of myasthenia can be present only in 30% or 50% of the patients. So if it's positive, it helps you. If it's negative, it really does not rule out ocular myasthenia gravis. What if you perform the other electrodiagnostic tests like uh, RNS and single fiber electromyography? If they are negative, what does it tell you? Well, repeated nerve fiber, nerve uh, stimulation studies in only 33% would have a positive response in a pure form of uh, ocular myasthenia gravis, while uh, SFEMG has a sensitivity of uh, 85% in a pure form of OMG. Now, this is a 32-year-old female who is inability to move, to move her eyes since last six years. And this is how her, her eyes look like. What do you think? She is not able to move her eyes at all. So would you, uh, obviously this is not a congenital ptosis, it has to be something else. So it can be a muscle problem, it can be a neuromuscular junction problem, or when the eyes are not moving at all, it can rarely be a supranuclear problem. So what do you think is happening here? Uh, and is there a test by which you can differentiate between a muscle problem and a supranuclear problem? Well, a simple test like a doll's eye movement or a passive eye movement will differentiate between a myopathy and a supranuclear eye disorder. In a supranuclear eye movement disorder, when you perform a doll's eye, the passive eye movements will be present, while in myopathy, the passive eye movement would be absent. So this was uh, probably a case of CPEO or chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Some of the tests which can be performed if you want to rule out uh, ocular myasthenia gravis would be tensilon test and prostigmin test. So tensilon is not that easily available. This is a 24-year-old male with a complete ptosis. This is again uh, showing one more variant or, or one of the features of myasthenia gravis. This patient is a known case of ocular myasthenia gravis and you will find here that the patient has ptosis, uh, nystagmus, but this, this nystagmus would die down because even those muscles get fatigued. So that's, again, a feature of oculomyasthenia gravis. Uh, it can have a gaze evoked nystagmus, which may look like INO, but generally there'll be intrasaccadic fatigue and the nystagmus would be transient. This is an interesting case which was seen at Chennai, 74-year-old male who said that after reading for 15 or 20 minutes, I get drooping. And this is how uh, his uh, features look like. I'll take one more minute. So you see that patient... Saccades are slow. He is not really able to move his eyes too well. And even there is a limitation of ocular movement. While all this was happening, we managed to knock his cataract out. And you will sleep uh, as what he was really experiencing. As you were examining the patient... This is what happened. Patient had sort of suddenly the eyes closed and then the left eye would slowly on its own would open up. You will, you'll find here that patient also has ectropion. So now what is this? Is this, obviously this is uh, some sort of uh, 
problem, neurological myopathy, myasthenia. This is not a simple disease. And then the eyes opened up. So this patient turned out to have oculomotor apraxia and patient turned out to have uh, Parkinson's-like syndrome, uh, PSP, which can present with oculomotor apraxia and patient might interpret his problem as problem of ptosis. So thank you so much. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Rohit for his talk? Very often missed, and we start doing all kinds of motility tests and uh, imaging uh, when we realize that it was monocular diplopia. If it's binocular, whether it's transient or persistent, and if it's persistent, then whether it's restrictive or paralytic, and if it's paralytic, whether it's polyneuropathy or mononeuropathy, and we'll see how that plays out. So monocular diplopia, if you know, you just close one of the eyes and close either eye. Often he'll close the eye which does not have the... Uh, mono, the monocular diplopia and say that yes I still continue to have so does not cover either does covering either eye make the diplopia disappear so there are a lot of important causes of monocular diplopia which uh, we know so yeah, when we have diplopia the next thing is whether it's transient or whether it's persistent so you have to ask him how frequently does it happen is it actually enough that it disables him is it uh, periodic, are there times when he does not? So there is a huge exhaustive list. Mycenae probably would be uh, talked about and mentioned in almost every uh, talk that will be happening in this session. So, in fact, one dictum which uh, I was taught when I was a junior resident was that if you don't know what the motility problem is, or where it can be loca localized to, think of myasthenia. So myasthenia can mim mimic anything, and often it mimics things which we don't even understand. So myasthenia, migraine, superior oblique myokemias, multiple sclerosis. So the patient may have diplopia for a period, and then he gets better, and it just disappears. So there may be recurrent episodes of diplopia happening, happening on and off. Of course, raised ICT can present with, uh, which is intermittently ra getting raised, and uh, in periods he gets a six nerve paresis and breaking of the foria. So occasionally he, his foria breaks and he's appreciating diplopia, and then he's quite fine and good. So these are causes of transient diplopia that you must be aware of. And like I said, uh, for transient, ask always for variability. That's one of the most important tests that can tell you. And a classical diurnal variability in a case of myasthenia is, is found, is most very often found, but sometimes missed. And you have to examine the patient for a period of time to know uh, uh, myasthenia. And of course, we know that uh, uh, a lot of ways it can present. And like I said, if you don't understand, think myasthenia. Uh, so the same patient, you can see post tensilon test, there's a significant improvement in ocular motility and it's often very dramatic. And ptosis, of course, is the best way, best thing to look at a marked improvement in ptosis after the tensilon test, but even diplopia. So you can actually see the, dis the patient's complaint of diplopia disappear after this. So when we're now looking at, but there's persistent now. So you know that it's persistent diplopia. It's, it's absolutely constant. It's there all the time. So you started looking in terms of restrictive or paralytic. So in restrictive uh, causes of diplopia, you can have a history of trauma if you do. So you would have uh, area fractures of the medial orbit or the floor of the fracture. And you can obviously pick up the uh, diplopia that there is. So trauma is one of the important things, thyroid of thalmopathy and anything that can actually be sitting in the orbit can give rise to a restrictive kind of a diplopia. So thyroid eye disease, extremely important often bilateral, but uh, proptosis along with it, but maybe asymmetric. So you may be able to miss the changes that, that you're seeing, the associated other changes. Medial rectus and inferior rectus, the most commonly affected muscle, and of course, eventually the patient may have other associated problems of uh, thyroid eye disease. And you can, you can do an extra, uh, you can do a CT or an MR to be able to pick up the fusiform enlargement of the extraocular muscles. And of course, the, you're always worried about two major causes of, uh, you know, loss of vision. One is, of course, exposure, and the other is optic nerve compression posteriorly, where all the, the muscles are going in and uh, originating from. So thickness there would cause compression of the optic nerve and cause loss of vision. Then you can have restrictive squints because of, you know, unusual things sitting in the orbit. So cysticercosis is very, uh, is an important thing in our country. And here you can see the, of course, there's a little bit of congestion that you can pick up, but you can see it's a patient of acquired browns. So diplopia presenting, looking like an acquired browns, we thought in terms of an orbital cysticercosis, and we found a cysticercosis sitting right on the, in the superior, uh, superior oblique muscle. So again, th that's the one thing you're looking at. Subsequently, we move on to the paralytic cause causes of squint, you could have a mononeuropathy, a clear-cut case of mononeuropathy, a third nerve, partial or complete third nerve, a sixth nerve or a fourth nerve palsy. 
So when you're looking at a patient with diplopia or complaints of diplopia and you think in terms of a mononeuropathy, you need to start examining him and looking for the exact motility disorder that the patient is having. Of course, head posture can tell you a, a, a tilt or a face turn, can easily tell you the etiology behind or give you a good idea about what is the cause of the diplopia. And then you, would, you can easily do a diplopia charting that will give you exactly what is the kind of diplopia. So there are multiple things you need to ask when you're doing diplopia charting. Uh, um, give him the red green goggles often they are able to ignore an image if it's a large angle they are often able to ignore the image so give them red green goggles you are then you have to follow them up give them if it's horizontal diplopia give them a, a straight object which is vertical so in the torch either you can put a slit cover over it so that they can see the, appreciate the vertical line and for horizontal for vertical diplopia make the slit horizontal so they are able to appreciate the vertical separation and you also have to ask for a, a torsion in a sense that are those two things you you're seeing the two lines you're seeing parallel or are they converging or diverging in any particular direction then uh, you need to look for uh, ocular movements in all gazes so subtle limitation of ocular motility has to be picked up so often the patient is not looking so much in that gaze and is not complaining of diplopia so frequently but when you do uh, the diplopia charting or when you do an ocular motility you're able to see the limitation of ocular motility that is there and as i said you have to do versions first so that you are able to pick up subtle defects in ocular motility you can do a HES charting or a Lee screen charting where you're able to actually make out the limitation of motility and identify the optic nerve that is involved, the nerve uh, that is involved causing the peresis. And uh, uh, like in, th in third nerve, diplopia charting can be very characteristic. You can see that the uh, the the two lines are separating out in this gaze. You can see that the verticals are increasing. So in third nerve, you're seeing reversal of the kind of diplopia. You're seeing the uh, right eye is higher in one and lower in the down gaze. So crossing over of this diplopia is very characteristically seen in uh, uh, third nerve palsy. So important causes of third nerve, you would have, in fact, they're important cause of all mononeuropathies. It's important that we must be always be careful about compressive lesions, mass lesions, or aneurysms in third nerve. And pupil is a very sensitive gauge for, for this. So any compressives would uh, affect the pupil and involve the pupil before they involve the rest of the nerve. A complete third nerve palsy involved the, involving the pupil, uh, an indication for imaging. A partial third nerve palsy currently sparing the pupil is also an indication because it may be part of an evolving third nerve. So pupillary involvement, go for imaging. Pupil is spared at the moment, you may actually follow up the patient in case of a incomplete third nerve palsy or an order in imaging. Or if it's complete third nerve with pupillary sparing, you know that it's not going to actually probably worsen and you can follow up the patient. So uh, uh, sparing the pupil, you could actually think in terms of uh, vascular causes which are responsible for this. And uh, as I said, that if pupil is involved, think of imaging. If there is partial, you may require an MR, uh, MRI to actually consider a possibility of an aneurysm or a space occupying. If it's complete third nerve with spared pupil, you can just follow up the patient. Fourth nerve palsy is uh, particularly most common cause is trauma, particularly bilateral, but there can be other causes, particularly in acquired uh, causes. And uh, nine gazes and a three-step test is very easy. You also need to look for torsion in the fundus to be able to identify that. Uh, and again, there are uh, numerous causes, the most common being traumatic or it, and idiopathic. A patient may actually break his fourth nerve, may have a, uh, a decompensated fourth nerve recently who had a congenital fourth nerve. And, and doing a family scan and his earlier photographs is important. And uh, neuroimaging is required if you have polyneuropathies, if you have multiple tumors or you suspect that there is no real reason why he has developed. Then uh, a six nerve palsy, again, you need to look at the fundus. The moment you have a six nerve palsy, you look at the fundus for raised ICT as a possible cause, as a uh, non-localizing or a false localizing sign. A six nerve palsy, if you have uh, associated other problems, you think of imaging immediately. If it's an isolated six nerve, in a younger patient, you must think of imaging. In an older patient with associated vascular problems, you can get away with it. Of course, if you have multiple cranial nerves, like I said, if it's a polyneuropathy, it helps you to localize where the lesion is and always do directed imaging. So if you localize it to the orbital apex where you have limited ocular motility, you have vision problems, you localize it to the orbital apex, uh, image the orbital apex. A generalized CT scan or an MRI of the brain is not going to pick 
pick up subtle lesions of the orbital apex. You have spared vision, but you have limitation of ocular motility, the cavernous sinus. So localize that depending upon what is the localization. So management, you can have various forms of management. Immediately, you would just plan prisms as non-surgical uh, medical management for myasthenia and thyroid ophthalmopathy. For cysticercosis, of course, you would require medical therapy. Botulinum toxin can be used, particularly in cases of six nerve palsy. And you plan surgery only after you have stabilized the patient. So uh, just a set, just an algorithm of how I would uh, actually follow up a case of diplopia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Roy. <clears throat> I have 16 minutes to give 20 minutes of talks. Let's go. Visual field defects, ignore, repeat, or worry. This is a course on decision making. I'm going to give you some tips on what I think might help you make those decisions. First of all, check visual fields. This is my colleague, Dr. Miller, checking with finger counting or a red object. Remember that you can detect 75% of clinically relevant visual field defects right there in the office by showing a red object. It can be eight red circles arrayed like this held in front of the patient or just a small red object, but it's a very sensitive method. But it's going to miss a quarter of the problems, and we still use Goldman as well as Humphrey uh, perimetry as shown here. Remember that the Goldman perimetry is going to be the one that checks all the way out to the full visual field to 90 degrees temporally and uh, smaller fields in uh, the appropriate physiologic directions. And Humphrey visual field testing, more sensitive, more reproducible, less dependent on the perimetrist, but still only test in general the central 30 degrees. I find the protocols that test outside the central 30 degrees to generally be not reliable. I'll start with a few visual field rules that I think are useful to keep in mind and then show you some cases in terms of decision making. So visual field rules to live by. The first is that visual field defects are opposite in location to the damaged fibers that have produced them. Monocular visual field defects are almost always caused by some kind of prechiasmatic process, whether it is media opacity, a retinal disturbance, or optic nerve disease, or it can be non-organic. And visual field defects produced by retinal and optic nerve lesions are identical. This is a neuro-ophthalmology course, but don't forget that retinal things can give similar defects. So this is an inferior visual field defect shown on this kinetic field. So what could be causing it? It's a course on neuro-ophthalmology but still the most common cause of this is glaucoma. So glaucoma can do this, but NAION with the swollen superior optic disc can give precisely the same field defect. So you can't prejudge what the abnormality will be based on the visual field defect alone. History still comes back into it, as does your examination. And a retinal lesion in a similar location can give you that same kind of visual field defect. So always keep that in mind. We tend to say that if you put an Amsler grid or some other similar grid in front of the patient, that if they have metamorphopsia, wavy lines as shown on the left side there, that that's more characteristic of retinal disease. And if they have missing spots or scotomas, that that is more characteristic of optic nerve disease. Does that hold to be true always? Well, of course not. Otherwise, I wouldn't show you that. Because a central scotoma, as you see here, can occur with papillitis, anterior optic neuritis, as in this patient, but it can also occur with a lesion in the fundus as well, in the retina. So a macular lesion can give the identical defect. This is not going to give metamorphopsia. It will give an absolute scotoma. You saw an example that Rushman showed you of a near chiasmatic defect. Remember, the chiasm is the only place for bitemporal field defects. And we tend to look at nice drawings and diagrams, as shown here on the right side, that give these beautiful delineated scotomas when you have posterior chiasmal compression, this small macular scotoma. If you have compression from beneath, you get uh, a nice scotoma from above that beautifully respects the vertical meridian. Well, guess what? Patients don't read the textbooks. They forget. And so they come in with visual fields that look more like the ones that are below, where, sure, there is a bitemporal characteristic to these visual field defects, but especially the field that's on your bottom right, there are these little nasal defects as well. What are they from? They're just because the patient took the visual field test for the first time and has some artifactual abnormalities there. So always look at the full pattern of the visual field and just have a little bit of a step back and say, what pattern am I seeing here? Is this diagnostic form? me and don't be distracted by little abnormalities that might steer you away to some other diagnosis. 
So lesions that then, of course, affect the visual system posterior to the chiasm almost always produce homonymous visual field defects that are bilateral, present in both eyes on the same side of the visual field, of course. And so in this optic tract lesion that's shown here in the left optic tract, the bright signal there, you can see that this produces a right homonymous hemianopia that is incongruous, worse in the left eye than in the right eye. That is characteristic of lesions that are anterior in that postchiasmatic pathway. So things in the tract are more likely to be incongruous. But a nice study that was done several years ago at Emory University showed that while posterior lesions, lesions that are back here in the occipital lobe, are very likely to be congruous, over 90% of them, you can get 50% of congruous lesions showing up more anteriorly in the visual pathway. So the rule to take away from this is that if the lesion is incongruous, different in the two eyes, it is very likely to be more anterior, not posterior. But if it is congruous, then it could be anywhere. So I want you to keep that in mind. Constricted visual fields like this, Dr. Ambika showed you a nice example of something similar to this, but much worse. This patient was sent to me as a bad visual field taker, and sometimes a patient who is not good at fields gets these constricted fields, but this is actually a patient who had retinopathy, a cancer-associated retinopathy, like the case she showed you. Similarly here, we have a patient who has nasal step visual field defects. We characteristically associate that with glaucoma, but we can see that in post-papilledema atrophy as well. So a correlation, the decision you have to make is based on a correlation between the visual field test and the fundus appearance as well as any ancillary testing. So let's run through some cases quickly here. A 67-year-old man had difficulty with reading for three months but no other problems. He had a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia and smokes. His exam showed 6-6 six, six acuity in both eyes and basically a normal examination. Confrontation visual fields were normal. This is a case where you have a patient with a complaint. You don't find anything on the exam. The visual field can be exceptionally helpful because on 10-2 visual field testing, this patient had an extremely small but highly congruous scotoma, a homonymous hemianopia, very small, that was associated with a posterior occipital lobe infarct. And because it was just next to fixation, it was disrupting his reading but not his distance vision to any extent. A different reason for poor reading but normal visual acuity is shown in this patient who was sent to me for possible malingering actually or unexplained vision loss because it was thought this was just a right-sided monocular visual field defect but when you look at the pattern deviation you see that in fact this is an incongruous homonymous hemianopia on the right side and in fact this patient had early dementia as a sign uh, uh, or with reading difficulty as the presenting sign. This 47-year-old woman had depression and anxiety. She had decreased visual acuity to about 612, 618. She was sent to me as a malingerer. She had the central visual field defect shown here on 24-2 perimetry, which are certainly central but possibly secocentral on the pattern uh, deviation. And in fact, this patient had B12 deficiency with her 40-pound weight loss. She had stopped eating, and she was nutritionally deficient. And with B12 replacement, she had improvement in her visual function function with worse sort of toxic nut uh, or nutritional optic neuropathies. You get visual field defects looking more like this. They don't look like the classic secocentral scotomas that you see on Goldman perimetry, but now that we all use Humphrey, when you see these patterns, think of a toxic or hereditary nutritional process. Finally, Dr. Ambika told you about functional visual loss. Visual fields are often very helpful there. This 18-year-old woman, uh, she, had, she said she had a problem in her right eye, sudden onset, no other symptoms, and her exam was otherwise normal except for this monocular temporal visual field defect in her right eye. So we classically say, well, maybe Goldman perimetry will be helpful. She'll make some mistakes. Well, no, she didn't. Um, she produced this same right-sided visual field defect in her right eye only. But then we did a binocular visual field, and it may be hard to see, but the blue line is with her left eye, and then the orange line inside it is with both eyes open. We know that the visual field shouldn't be smaller with both eyes open than with both with one eye open. And so clearly this was a patient who was malingering, and this was evidence for that with a smaller visual field binocularly than monocularly. 
So visual field defects can arise from optic nerve or retinal problems. Homonymous defects are always postchiasmal. The bitemporal defects may not follow the rules. And directed imaging is helpful in diagnosis, but in doubt, just repeat the field and make sure it's real. Thank you. For the pathogenesis, I will talk merely about the management here. A typical case of NAION, 55-year-old man, vascular risk factors, noticed vision loss in his right eye while watching television, 618 acuity, RAPD in the right eye, a superior altitudinal defect on visual field testing, inferior optic disc swelling with some uh, edema adjacent to the disc that's not a, a cotton wool spot, and some peripapillary hemorrhage. I won't talk about arteritic AION. That is a topic that, uh, for the next talk. So NAION treatment goals. What would we want to do? Well, pretty much what we want to do with any patient. Preserve or improve visual function, visual acuity, or visual field. Prevent involvement of the fellow eye. And treat systemic disease because we are still doctors and we want to make sure our patients don't have heart attacks, strokes, or other problems that might occur in association with this. Before we can treat any disease, we need to know what the natural history is. Our treatment must be better than natural history. So what is the natural history of this condition? What percentage have improvement in visual fields and visual acuity? What's the incidence in the fellow eye? And does modifying risk factors help? One of the first, so one of the first studies to look at treatment was to look at surgical treatment. I'll talk about surgical treatment, medical treatment. But we learned a lot about natural history, too. Because in the first study, IONDT, over 20 years ago, patients were enrolled within two weeks of onset of their vision loss. Over 250 patients were enrolled, randomized to surgery or observation. They had to have visual acuity of 2064 or about 618 or worse. And the ones who were treated with surgery were more likely to lose vision, 43% versus only, excuse me, 43% of patients got better when they weren't treated versus 33% of patients who had surgery. And patients got worse 24% of the time with surgery compared to 12% of the time without it. So the conclusion from this study was not only that nerve sheath fenestration didn't work, but it could be harmful, but we learned that 43% of patients have improvement in visual acuity and 24% of patients have improvement in visual field, even if you do nothing. So treatment has to be better than this. The the study was underpowered to address whether pro patients with progressive visual loss were helped by the intervention, we'll, uh, but that's for another time. So what other surgery has been proposed? It has been suggested that vitreous traction may be involved in the pathogenesis of this disease, so maybe vitrectomy could help. In a small study, 16 patients with ischemic optic neuropathy and partial PVD had surgery within one month of visual loss. Nine of them showed improvement of greater than three lines. This turned out to be statistically significant, but if only one patient fewer had improved, the statistical significance would have been lost. So always be careful interpreting data from small studies. And in fact, because of that, and because of the fact that when you look at this vitreous traction as in this paper, it's not all that impressive. I see this all the time, just on other patients. And so several of us, uh, published with uh, Dr. Michael Lee, looked at consecutive patients with, with NAION and found that in 26 patients, 17 did not have this vitreous connection, making us skeptical that this has anything to do with the pathogenesis of the disease. And you can see this in glaucoma and other patients as well. So I don't advocate surgery of any kind for NAION. So how about medical therapy? Well, what would the goal of medical therapy be? It might be to decrease the swelling. It might be to protect axons. And as you do that, the swelling goes away, or it may be both. But again, we want to improve optic disc appearance to improve visual acuity as well as visual field. That's our goal. So what kind of medical therapy might work? Well, corticosteroids, in theory, could be helpful. NAION might be a compartment syndrome where swelling leads to further ischemia, leads to more swelling, leads to more ischemia. Steroids, by reducing edema, could break that cycle, help edema to resolve more quickly, and then preserve retinal ganglion cell function, preserve axonal health. And if you did this early, ideally, that would be the time to intervene. So there were a number of case of reports since the 1960s suggesting that giving oral steroids might help and some anecdotal use since that time. 
the largest study looking at this was published by Dr. Harry from University of Iowa, 613 patients, about half of them treated with corticosteroid, uh, but this was not a randomized study. And of course, non-diabetic patients were much more likely to be treated than were diabetic patients. Of 312 patients who were treated, the majority started with good visual function, 6'6 six, six up to about 6'9, and they didn't worsen. And But that's also true of the patients who didn't have steroid. So because there was no difference in this category with good vision, he looked at patients with 2070 or about 618, 624 vision or worse. And what he found in this subgroup was that maybe the patients who were treated with steroids within two weeks of onset of visual loss did better. But there were a lot of problems. It wasn't a randomized trial. The investigator was not masked to the study treatment. The results were based on a post hoc analysis that was not originally intended. And we still don't know what the pathophysiologic basis for it might be. A study published last year in, in Grafies out of Iran uh, randomized patients to IV, ONTT type steroids, to uh, supplemental oxygen, and no treatment, and found no significant effect. There have been other studies in India that suggested that. Maybe steroids work. The bottom line is there's still a lot of controversy surrounding this, and we really don't know, and it's difficult to plan clinical trials that might address this question. Plus, systemic steroids have a lot of potential side effects. So why don't we try intravitreal steroids? They would potentially put the steroid right at the area of necessity, right at the optic disc, and have no systemic side effects. Just a few case reports in the literature more than 10 years ago. Nothing more has really come of that. And so our results of that are very limited. We really don't know if this is an efficacious treatment. People have been hesitant to do it. Well, our retina colleagues inject anti-VEGF therapy for everything. Why shouldn't we use it as well, right? We should make money off this too. So sure, let's inject anti-VEGF treatment. The rationale is by reducing vascular leakage, you reduce edema, you're not trying to treat neovascularization. What are the data on this? My colleague Jeff Bennett published the first case report of this 10 years ago in a patient who had second eye involvement of NAION, got injection three weeks after vision loss. The visual acuity improved, but the visual field didn't really get better. So Okay, one case. Subsequent follow-up prospective studies have not demonstrated that anti-VEGF agents are any better than natural history in terms of visual acuity and visual field improvement. And in fact, a case report was published where a patient who underwent injection of a VEGF agent in the left eye with a CNVM, as shown with the arrow here, presented five days later with new left optic disc swelling and peripapillary hemorrhage of showing onset of NAION. So the thought was maybe even that NAION could be caused by an intravitreal injection and by anti-VEGF treatment. So this treatment has fallen out of favor now. Some animal data suggests that intravitreal injection of erythropoietin, which we use to stimulate red blood cell production, but could also be neuroprotective, that this intravitreal injection at the time of an ischemic insult to the optic nerve results, as shown here on this graph, in better retinal ganglion cell survival as well as better function on ERG. This is animal data. We have no human data to support this. In the next uh, hour, we're go- uh, you'll hear more about uh, QPI 1007, which is a, a small inhibitory RNA. It blocks the ex- uh, expression of caspase 2, a molecule that is involved in the cell cycle and that is overexpressed in NAION and seems to uh, induce apoptosis or programmed cell death. This is being studied because in initial safety trials, it was suggested that this molecule had better visual acuity outcomes than patients who, uh, from historic controls from the IONDT. So at this point, we are still trying to figure out what treatment is going to help the affected eye. What about the fellow eye? What can we do to prevent disease? Well, avoiding ED ED drugs. Rushman mentioned this. A case crossover study showed that there was an over two-fold increased risk of NAION in patients taking erectile dysfunction drugs within five half-lives of the onset of their NAION. 
Sleep apnea has been shown in several studies to have an epidemiologic link. 71% of patients in the first study of patients with NAION had sleep apnea syndrome. And if it's been shown that if those patients don't use their CPAP, their therapy for the sleep apnea, that their risk increases 5.5 fold of having fellow eye involvement. So in conclusion, the therapies much, must be better than natural history. And no current agent has tremendous therapeutic value. Risk factor reduction, I think, still holds some potential here because protection of fellow eye may be the most realistic goal at this time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.